Okay. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are going to get go ahead and get started. Um, uh, so typically our webinars are about 45-ish minutes, uh, but this time I, I hope that I can finish it uh, within 45 minutes, but likely we are going to actually go all the way to like around 55 to 60 minutes. So a lot of content, a uh, uh, lot of things packed, but my hope is that by the end of this, uh, this talk, you will actually understand what uh, large language models are and uh, most importantly, maybe what they are not, right? So, and how do they work? Uh, you may have heard of different ideas like embeddings, prompt engineering, vector databases. So you will have a very basic working knowledge of what, what that means. Of course, nothing very substantial and deep, uh, but overall a general appreciation of the architectures uh, and the, the prevalent architectures, uh, uh, common design patterns, and also what are the fundamentals that you need to um, get a grasp of to be able to understand how an uh, LLM application is built. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Simple agenda, I will go probably for about 30 minutes. I'm going to, or maybe 35-ish minutes, I will spend uh, most of my time actually in this talk in setting the fundamentals right, because I cannot explain uh, the arc, any design patterns or any uh, architecture to you without you uh, understanding the fundamentals. For those of you who already understand these ideas, please bear with me. This is important uh, for other people to be able to understand and appreciate the architecture. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started, uh, jump right into uh, the fundamentals. I will start with embeddings. Uh, then I will talk about the general idea of semantic similarity. You must have heard of uh, you know, this idea of semantic uh, search or semantic similarity. We'll talk about vector databases. Why do we need them? Then what are vector similarity measures? Uh, uh, then um, what is prompt engineering? What is large language model? And what is a foundation model? And what does in-context learning mean? So that's a very high level summary of the fundamentals. Let's go ahead and get started. So this is the first slide uh, in the talk, and this is going to be also the last slide, right? So my hope is by the time we finish the fundamentals and revisit the slide again, you will actually understand what's going on. Right now, it is overwhelming. Uh, definitely, I mean, if anyone looks at it the first time, hey, what is this contextual data and data bricks to, uh, here? Uh, why do we have this thing called LangChain here? And you know, what is Anthropic and what is OpenAI? How are Anthropic and OpenAI related? So uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a lot of things. But as I said, by the end of, uh, uh, by the, end of the talk, you will understand all of these in detail. Hey, yeah. Raj, I'm going to pause you for a second. I think at least one person is having issues seeing slides. Oh, never mind. I think slides are okay. Never mind. I think it's a in individual technical issue. Okay. So, yeah, Nathan, can you see it? Yes. Yes, we okay. can see your slides. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Let me know if there are any technical issues. Um, so, uh, first of all, when I look at this image, right? So as a human, I can um, I can recognize this as Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but how do machines actually? So when we talk about uh, models like uh, Dolly, and we talk about uh, you know um, um, stable diffusion models, and you know Mid Journey, and all of that, how does how do computers work? So uh, computers work on numbers, right? So whether uh, you're giving them well numbers, actually numbers, or you give them some piece of text or some images, some pixel values really anything. This is what humans see. And uh, on the other end of the spectrum, when this image goes to a machine, machine sees this. So basically, uh, the, uh, the, the, what all of us need to understand, for those of you who are absolute beginners in machine learning, the idea is that anything that, that is given to you, whether it is an image or uh, a table, uh, you know, some text, um, all of that has to be converted into some numeric representation. And in that case, uh, text is no different, right? So imagine imagine I have some, some magical way of uh, mapping um, my documents, or maybe all the words, right? So uh, this is a truck, and the truck is located on this X and Y uh, or horizontal vertical coordinate system. Uh, it is located at six and one. Bicycle is at five atom, five and one. There is these cherries and um, bananas and uh, strawberries. Uh, all of them, they are located at different places. And there is some mechanism that takes these words and maps them into 
some, uh, in this case, in a plane. And when we talk about, uh, um, when we talk about huge documents, it is a very high dimensional space, right? So you think of this as extending it to three or four or maybe even thousand dimensions. So when you when you hear about this, that the, your embeddings are in, uh, like this is an embedding in two dimension, but when you talk about em embeddings in a higher dimension, sometimes you'll see 4,000 plus dimensions, right? So each text uh, piece of text is mapped like this, okay? So let's actually continue with this example. For instance, right? So if there is an apple and a soccer ball and a house and a car, um, there is some mapping mechanism that actually takes each of these words and it maps them to um, the concepts that are closer to um, uh, closer to the, the 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 meaning that these concepts communicate, right? So the uh, apple is a fruit, right? So it is uh, it is close by related to a fruit versus a soccer ball versus a house. It's a building, and this is a um, uh, this is a vehicle or uh, you know. Uh, uh, right, uh, uh, you know, uh, you you map them according to the semantic understanding and meaning. So embeddings actually are what emb embeddings do is um, imagine I have uh, I have millions and millions of documents that I've processed, right? And I know certain words they appear uh, close to each other in uh, in the context of uh, you know, for instance, here, right? So a man wearing uh, a life vest is sitting in a canoe, all right? So, and semantically, um, when you have seen the boat, uh, a boat in a canoe multiple times, there are actually, um, there are uh, techniques that actually can figure out that canoe and boat are usually used, uh, they're often used in a similar context. Let's actually put them together. So um, sem semantically, they are similar. So uh, this is a great example in this case of, uh, if you look at th these two sentences, um, if I asked you, are they similar in, in, the, in a lexical context? Lexical meaning, are the words the same? Well, uh, we are talking about a guy here, we are talking about a man. And then this, uh, this guy is wearing a red jacket. Uh, so there's a red jacket in the first sentence, there is a, um, you know, there's a life vest. This is stand. This person is standing. Uh, the guy is standing. The man is sitting. The the guy is on a boat, and the man is in a canoe. So if you look at this, uh, if uh, it may not be obvious with just two sentences, but if we extend it to perhaps millions and uh, hundreds of millions of documents, then patterns start to emerge. Okay, let's continue here. So what is a vector database then? Well. When we create these embeddings, we are not talking about you know um, you know a man and a guy or maybe uh, apple and a soccer ball and uh, a car and a house. We are actually talking about hundreds of millions of embeddings here, right? So because you have you have so many doc documents, um, perhaps you have some audio files. Audio is also converted into vectors, uh, similar numeric representation. Then text is also converted into, well, text vector embeddings. And then videos are also, they are converted into video embeddings. So, and uh, embeddings can be on really anything, right? So for instance, for images, uh, they could be, uh, they could be a combination of the, you know, the grayscale values or maybe uh, the RGB values, you know, uh, it could also be the text annotation that goes with them. So it could be a lot of, a uh, lot of that surrounding context. Um, that is converted into numeric representation and stored in a vector database. And why do we need a vector database? Why not just our regular good old databases? Because uh, vector databases are optimized for storing, indexing, and retrieving unstructured data. And unstructured means, well, they are not in that, uh, you know, uh, rows and columns. Uh, for those of you who have uh, done some machine learning, typically, any machine learning model, when we when we actually build models, usually you have data in rows and columns, right? But when you're talking about uh, what if the data is not in rows and columns, how are you going to work on that? So it, it think of this as converting each of these um, uh, each of these uh, entities, whether they are videos and text or audios, any kind of document, converting them into this uh, uh, this format uh, that it uh, that turns them into more like vectors. Here's an example. 
So if I converted, let's say this word called apple and uh, you know, soccer ball and house and a car, um, uh, notice this, right? So each of them is represented by a vector. Uh, you know, they, this is a vector which is five and five. This is a vector which is zero and six. This is a vector which is six and zero. Now, what does, uh, how do, uh, how do uh, vector databases handle uh, these? Vector databases will take these numbers, right? So five and five, zero and six, six and zero, and they are going to actually store them um, in, um, well, in the database. Now, if it is stored in the database, we are not only, uh, one of the techniques would be is, well, if a new uh, object comes in, let's say a new word comes in and it is located perhaps at uh, you know, two and four, like right here. So how are we going to actually find out which, um, which of the, which of the object or which of the set of objects is most similar to this particular um, new object that we are looking for. It could be a text document, it could be a video, it could be an audio, it could be really any entity. So when you do this right here, when you decide to actually find out which ones are most similar, there are different techniques. Um, you can find the distance between, um, you know, one technique could be is, uh, I can go and find the distance for this new object from this, uh, this, this object that is already stored, then the next object, then the next object. But imagine we are not only talking about uh, a bunch of fruits and you know, uh, uh, different types of balls and automobiles and et cetera. We're talking about uh, index, think Amazon, think Facebook, right? So you're talking about probably hundreds of millions of products that you're hundred millions of entities that you're uh, maybe Facebook posts, maybe LinkedIn posts that you're trying to retrieve in real time there has to be a better way of indexing. There are different techniques, which in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through. Think of this as one brute force technique would be is when a new document comes in and you have to find the most uh, five most relevant objects, you calculate the distance, of, uh, uh, distance from that object to all of them. Well, definitely not the most optimized technique, but then there are different indexing techniques that these databases use. Um, uh, there is something called HNSW, right? Big words. When you go and read them, you will understand what they are. Locality sensitive hashing, uh, really things that are semantically similar, they get mapped close by. Um, then there is something called PQ, product quantization. And there's, there is a few other techniques. As I said, uh, the idea, um, uh, we just want to communicate the idea. If you are interested, definitely there are some resources uh, that we can share that you can uh, get into and uh, understand. So how do you find similarity? Um, there are actually um, maybe, I mean, dozens of similarity measures. I'm going to talk about mainly uh, the two type of, uh, two of them. The, there's one which is called cosine similarity. Uh, so cosine similarity or, and then the other one is Euclidean distance. What is cosine similarity? If I calculate, if I want to know the cosine similarity between an apple and a banana, well, um, I know uh, apple is a vector, banana is a vector, and I'm going to calculate the angle between. Uh, and if you remember from your high school days, uh, you know uh, we know how to calculate angle between two vectors. I mean, so straight away, simple formula. You calculate this angle between two of them, and then there is an angle between uh, apple and this car. And then the smaller the cosine of that angle, the more similar the products are. If they are perfectly aligned with each other, then they are exactly identical, right? So that's the high level idea. Um, then if you, if you talk about, you know, Euclidean distance, Euclidean distance is really, um, the str I mean, think, think about this as a direct distance between both of them, right? So you can see that Euclidean distance between banana and uh, apple is uh, represented by this particular line. And then uh, apple and the car is represented by this particular line. Okay, let's keep going. So, so what is a large language model? So now that we understand what an embedding is and what is a vector database and how do we find this, uh, find similarities between you know um, pieces of text or um, maybe videos and possibly music. So uh, I have this very simple example that most of us can relate to. 
Um, so I started typing this sentence. Let's say I'm, uh, I have a large language model that is predicting what might be my next word. So last night I was reading Harry Potter and, the, and then now when I look at this, well, these are all of the Harry Potter books. And if I look at these books, um, the word philosopher, and these are made of probabilities, they don't indicate any real numbers here, uh, and Harry Potter and uh, the philosophers, 4.5%, and sorcerers, 3.2%, uh, and prisoner as uh, uh, 3.1%. So these are all the, uh, all the books, uh, Harry Potter books, and I know what, uh, what is the next most likely word. Now, uh, what can I do? What I can do here is, I am going to, uh, well, um, the way a large language model works is it takes the, uh, in, for simplicity's sake, let's actually talk about this, that uh, it goes for the highest probability path. And the next word, uh, of course, it's going to be philosophers because that's the most likely word that will make the sentence complete. Can it be sorcerers? Of course it can be sorcerers, but you are going for the highest probability word that is the next word now so what is a large language model i mean as fancy as it like i mean we talk about deep neural networks we talk about you know these uh, huge neural networks and lots of compute and you know nvidia releasing gpus after gpus and open ai and tropic all of them talking about it under the hood they are well think of a large language model as a giant statistical model built on a large amount of language data so at, uh, in essence, what it is, is some probabilities. What is the next most probable word? If, and then if is basically what data the model was trained on. And that should also, I mean, I'm not going to get into the uh, other challenges like bias and uh, fairness, but your models are going to be a depiction of the data that goes in. If you have data that is biased, if your data uh, it has been labeled by people um, uh, who may have a different understanding. So for instance, right? So I'm, uh, if I am in North America right now, and then uh, you know, a model that is trained here on certain things, on certain cultural things or certain social things, right? So uh, there may be a difference and that may result in some discrepancy. And I mean, if you talk about, you know, um, you know if the, the the data in bias is going to appear uh, or the bias in data is going to appear in your models predictions or models um, you know whatever it generates so how does it work well um, in a, a large language model it works uh, by you digitize i mean whether it's uh, you know most of the data of course i mean it's digitized uh, uh, but you can actually digitize the data if it is not already digitized uh, put that in your neural network and then train this uh, model, and uh, and and that's pretty much it, right? So, and then that's how it works, right? So this is think of this as a giant, huge neural network. But now, let's actually look at this. I decided to add some context to my, some uh, to my example. What is the context? What I'm saying now is um, the context that uh, that uh, exists is. Harry Potter and the uh, Philosopher's Stone, it was released as uh, Sorcerer's Stone in the US. Scholastic uh, released this book with a different name for whatever marketing reasons. And now what I'm saying here is, last night I was reading Harry Potter and, the, and now the next word, I don't know. I'm also adding some context. Remember, I live in New York and I bought my book from the United States and suddenly, I mean, think about this, that I'm almost tilting the probability. I'm actually shifting the probability in favor of a different next word. I mean, that's that's really what is happening. And uh, this is why prompt engineering is in, incredibly important. I, I actually, anytime I add more context, sometimes it's just a matter of actually adjusting your prompts, right? So, and in this case, what is a prompt? Well, prompt is any additional context or instructions added to the query. Think about this, right? So when we say act like a marketer, so now what? Uh, large language model actually has, per, uh, perhaps it has a lot of data that has been labeled as, well, marketing brochures or marketing campaigns, and it tweaks the probability of the next word according to how a marketer, the terminology that a marketer would use, right? 
maybe tone, add some humor. It has some humor and it will st now start to actually inject those in appropriate places. And then I, I can keep going. So this is why prompt engineering is important. And um, from my experience, prompt engineering is probably one of the, by far the most important aspects of uh, building an LM application. So let's go with this. Uh, let's take this example. Um, I am talking about, uh, well, uh, you know, I start with the word Harry. And uh, when I say Harry, um, the first context is Markle. The sec uh, second context is Hogwarts. The third one is music. And the fourth one is also music. So what should I anticipate here? I anticipate that in the first two cases, it is going to be, well, uh, you can see, uh, you know, but um, uh, I mean, these two are obvious. This is Prince Harry and this is uh, Harry Potter, right? But in the second case, both have this context music. Now, what, what would happen, right? So it, it might give me maybe one of the answers that hallucination, if you remember, I mean, so there's this concept of hallucination, right? So I, I was not sure, what can I do? I mean, I, I had no idea. How can you avoid hallucination? Well, provide more context. In this case, I'm saying, English, right? So, or American. And then the moment I said this, both of them were uh, involved in music. But now we are talking about when, uh, well, first of, first one was, an, uh, first one is an English musician. The second one is an American. So good prompt engineering plays a central role in performance of an uh, LLM application. It is about uh, giving more context to your foundation model. Um, so if you look at this, yeah, that's, uh, it's almost like you are actually turning the odds of correct answer in your favor. That's what prompt engineering is about. So I went ahead and actually, so I came up with this example and then I said, okay, let me go back and what, uh, what, uh, what does chat GPT do? So I said, uh, I asked chat GPT, um, tell me more about a singer named Harry who's popular. And it gave me um, the name of this uh, singer, Harry Styles, uh, and then went ahead. Now, then I said, no, I'm asking about the American singer named Harry. And then basically, um, Chad GPT got confused. And then I said, okay, maybe since I said is here, maybe it is confused by this. It is assuming that this is present tense. So I said, he's a, I added this, and this is my chat history, actually. He's a singer from the past. Oh, thanks for clarifying. Uh, you're asking about a historical American singer named Harry, and there are a few possibilities that come to my mind, and I think I forgot to copy this. It gave me two options. It was still somewhat uh, uh, ambiguous uh, uh, or not very sure. It gave me, uh, of course, um, the singer that you see on the screen, and then there is another name uh, that was there. So. Um, I wish I could go into detail. Uh, there is uh, some of you may have heard of this uh, this groundbreaking foundational paper in this space called "Attention is All You Need," and the idea is really you process lots and lots of text, like uh, blocks of text. Let, let let me call it blocks of text, um, and then you see how likely is it that one word is uh, uh, going to appear. Um, uh, within a context window, um, how likely is it that another word, word will appear? So um, uh, maybe some for some other time, uh, I'm going to actually skip through this. What I'm going to do here is, um, you know, just explain uh, this idea of foundation model. Then I will go back and explain this idea of the context window. I mean, what does it mean, uh, the block of text? So really, foundation models are large language models that are trained of on massive amounts of, well, not necessarily public data, but some of those that are available, they are actually, well, they are called foundation model and, uh, you know, GPT series models, GPT-2, GPT-3, GPT-3.5, 3. Uh, or uh, 4.0, uh, all of these are foundation models and each of them is good with different, different tasks. So, when we talk about this large language model, if someone next time says, uh, you know, uh, what is a foundation model? Well, so foundation um, uh, foundation models are actually a large language model is essentially is a uh, is a is a foundation model. Um, 
some of the foundation models that are there uh, are, you know, there is uh, OpenAI, Anthropic is there. Um, uh, Facebook recently had, uh, I think, uh, Llama 2 should be here. Hugging Face has one. Replicate has one. This space is also, um, I would not say very crowded. I mean, there are some key players. And the, um, and the barrier in this is um, likely there's going to be some degree of monopoly in this space because the amount of compute it takes, it is non-trivial. Uh, you and I or smaller companies cannot afford to actually train foundation models from scratch. And uh, the way foundation models are used is, uh, I will explain when I, when I get to the in-context learning idea that uh, since um, none of us have that uh, those resources to actually create those foundation models from scratch, uh, we actually rely on the foundation models for their language uh, capabilities or the semantic capabilities. And we bring in the external sources of knowledge and somehow combine those uh, that context or the knowledge with the language capabilities. So it speaks like a human while it has some, uh, the model has been augmented with some context. And I will explain that in a moment. So uh, here's an example, right? So, uh, and I'm now talking about what is, uh, uh, so you must have heard of this idea of token limits or context windows. So we're talking about, let's say, uh, summarize this document for me, right? So, and I gave it, um, uh, gave it this document, um, which is uh, the Declaration of uh, Independence. And I'm a, my assumption is the document was not used in the training process, right? So this is a document. It's unlikely, um, definitely ChatGPT knows it because it's, uh, you know, um, um, maybe hundreds of thousands of web websites will have uh, Declaration of Independence on, uh, on, the, on the site. But I'm, I'm assuming that uh, it wasn't there. Now, think about this. This particular document is 1,320 words, about three pages. I gave it to, let's say this was chat GPT or some other foundation model. Uh, it says, yeah, the document is about America's freedom from British rule, asserting natural rights, condemning tyranny, and justifying self-governance. Great, right? So it worked. But what about if I um, if I gave Chat GPT once again? I'm assuming Harry Potter and the and the Goblet of Fire. They are not part of the training process. Let's say I wanted to summarize this document. I'm going to get an error. Why will I get an error? Because this document is too big to fit within what we call the context window. And there is some limits that the way the model has been trained, this is going to result in an error because it can only handle small pieces of small chunks of data at a time, okay? So next time when you see, uh, so I copied it from um, OpenAI uh, developer guide, I guess, or whatever reference it was. So you can see now, um, so when we talk about tokens, right? So GPT-3 family is 2000 tokens and uh, a token is about 1500 words on average and about three pages, right? And then uh, when we talk about GPT-4, 32K, there is, it is 32,000 tokens. And then there is, uh, it is about 49 pages. So if you give it for, uh, 49 pages at a time, it is not going to be able to summarize or it is not going to be able to analyze or do what you want it to do. Okay, but most of our enterprise data is of course going to be more than that. And we are talking about, I think Anthropic released this uh, model, plot two, uh, and that model has, I think it has a hundred K token limit, right? So now you can still say that it's, it's bigger, but it's not actually everything. What do we do? So I think we have talked about this, right? So there are different approaches that we can take. What we can take is take, uh, don't worry about chat GPT, don't worry about BARD or Anthropic, train a model from scratch. Well, um, uh, easier said than done, because when you decide to, when you decide to train a model from scratch, 
it is going to be, it will require some specialized skills. And more than that, I think the amount of compute and the, uh, the cost, it is going to be not possible for you, right? Um, there is this approach of fine tuning models. What you do is you, you take one of the foundation models and then, then build on top of it. So you still actually use the foundation model, but you do some um, parameter tuning on it. You add some data and then retune the parameters. Uh, but once again, um, somewhat expensive and also somewhat of a, a tricky. Um, and I, I don't think everyone can actually do it well. The third approach is use the off-the-shelf model for language generation and use your custom data for knowledge representation. So take that take that base model, take that base model as uh, as, a, as uh, your language generator, and then take your custom data for knowledge representation. And that's how this will work. So uh, training model from scratch. It goes from you know take the data. Whatever data it is, bigger context uh, window, and then maybe you know chunk the data and then push it inside whatever it is, right? So, and then uh, it, it is impractical for most enterprises. Even fine tuning, taking an off-the-shelf model and then tweaking the model, that is also possible, but not the most uh, cost-efficient approach. The final approach is something like this. Instead of taking the entire document, entire um, uh, this whole um, book, chunk this book into pages, maybe 380 pages. Just maybe, uh, you know, just rip the pages apart, scan them, and, you know, just uh, one page becomes one document, another page becomes another document. And uh, let's forget about that book, right? So let's say you have 380 tickets, right? So one approach is to training on all the tickets, other is you know, in, uh, using uh, all those tickets separately. So you chunk those tickets into, into uh, well, chunks, uh, as we call them, or pages. And then you convert each of the page into embeddings. There are tools for that. You will be amazed how simple, how incredibly simple this whole thing becomes if you understand the bigger picture. Um, so each page becomes like, you know, one of those apples and uh, uh, one of those house and, you know, other objects that I showed earlier in the presentation. You convert these into embeddings, store them in a vector database. And now when the new query, uh, when, um, when, uh, uh, when someone asks, uh, summarize all of the support tickets for uh, delay and arrival of, uh, in arrival of policy documents, it goes and uh, so the engine in, in context learning first goes and retrieves all the tickets that are related to that has maybe semantically related to delays and uh, perhaps policy documents. Maybe it will say insurance documents, but it knows that it is semantically related. It is going to return only the documents that are related to the query. And then now this foundation model only summarizes the tickets that are relevant to the query. So it's almost like call it. Uh, the, this is uh, this approach is called retrieval augmented uh, generation. So what you're doing is you're augmenting instead of going and generating the next word and the next word and next word. Instead of doing that, you first actually search for the relevant documents that are uh, because now you have a specialized set of documents. ChatGPT does not know what you have in your tickets, how many customers were unhappy, how many uh, customers were complaining. They don't know how many customers were happy. So when you ask this question, it returns all the tickets related to, related to the, um, the query. And then uh, the way this works is um, the base, the, the foundation model actually helps generate the language of it and then the knowledge representation is coming from the tickets that were retrieved. And in this case, you have sort of, um, you have modified the problem or you have uh, reduced the problem to a, um, maybe a search followed by a LLM generation type problem. So if I put it all together here, um, uh, now I'm back to um, where we started. So what is all? 
this, right? So um, it is um, incredibly, incredibly fascinating how accessible these things are, right? So we are using, um, I think uh, my team, I don't do as much work, uh, uh, hands-on work, but uh, my team is actually uh, building on a lot of interesting things, right? So you have used OpenAI directly, uh, Azure uh, as well, um, Azure uh, OpenAI through Azure, Hugging Face. I know uh, some of the, I think Llama 2, some, uh, some of them uh, we have built at Llama 2 should, do, should have been here. Um, then, now these are all the models, right? So then you have um, this, this thing called LLM cache. Okay, let me go back and try to explain. Uh, so now, every time when I come and um, issue a query, when I send a query, um, it first goes and retrieves the documents. The next time, every time it goes to OpenAI and asks, okay, can you tell me the answer? Now think about this, just like our regular caching mechanism, our CPU cache, our memory cache, our you know, other types of caches, uh, caching mechanism. Similarly, a large language models can have a cache. In this case, summarize all support documents for delay and arrival. Sometimes next time, uh, give me a summary of all support tickets uh, open for delay and arrival. Or maybe the same query, right? If someone comes back and asks for the same query or uh, um, gives the same query, well, it is, it is counterproductive that I go and again ask my foundation model, what should we do? So LLM caches actually cache the queries that are semantically similar, and then also cache the responses. So if it is similar, then it will go and give you the answer without actually going and hitting the foundation model. You save on cost. You save, uh, you know, the compute cost. You, you know, so, so it's it uh, it adds up fairly quickly, right? So it may look like that it is, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 a tenth of a cent for per thousand tokens. But when you start sending out uh, these requests, it adds up very very quickly. So, um, and this is actually um, I consider that to be uh, some of the systems that we built on earlier. We did not were not doing LLM caching. But now I think we are convinced that now we should have LLM cache. But the downside is, what if the first answer was correct and it, it got cached? So um, be aware of that. So use LLM caching with care. Now logging in LLM ops, right? So you, know, uh, so you have to maintain the entire pipeline when you build the model, deploy the model, a versioning of the model, maybe you know, um, any, any explainability in the model, um, logging related things. What do you do? Well, there are actually standard of the shelf uh, frameworks and services that can actually help. Now, uh, and I will go through this one by one, um, not to all of them, but most of them will cover. What about, um, what about if, uh, because uh, um, your data may have uh, some biases, maybe your data has some, so for instance, right? So you are using this in an enterprise setting and how do you prevent your model to start saying stuff or maybe maybe politically incorrect stuff, right? So maybe uh, some profanities actually make it into your, uh, into your responses. How do you prevent that? How do you make sure that your model is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not biased in the sense that it is not, um, um, maybe the responses are not biased. How do you make sure that your answers are consistent? How do you make sure that you have some baseline data set? Uh, because in this case, this is language. In this case, you know, you're talking about a big, the scope of the problems that you're dealing with. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, it, it's quite open-ended. So there are some validation frameworks that exist um, that once again should be incorporated in whatever you do. Um, this is once again, vector databases. Um, I think we should have Redis here, most notably, uh, it should be here. Uh, but if you look at this, um, uh, this is a, um, a um, you can use, uh, we work with Redis very closely, uh, but in this case, if you look at this, uh, Chroma is there, Pinecone is there, uh, even Postgres has uh, some, um, some vector capabilities, which I've not personally used. 
um, your models, so your foundation models, right? So uh, you use, um, uh, even for embeddings, use foundation models. These are only just three of the players. This needs to actually, there's some reworking that is needed on this infographic. I mean, uh, uh, we have injected only some in each of the cases. Um, now, if I come here, orchestration, right? So uh, if I'm building an end-to-end -end app, now think about this. How do I actually break this down into multiple chunks? How do I make sure um, that uh, these chunks, if I'm getting some insights so from one chunk and another chunk, how do I combine them? How do I ensure that the output format is, uh, is consistent with what I wanted it to be? So there are frameworks, uh, Langchain uh, being the most popular one, uh, where uh, how the input should be st structured, the, in the schemas, um, in what order they should be combined, some 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 sort of map reduce like uh, fashion, orchestration frameworks actually help you uh, when your data is uh, scattered, different types of data sources, right? So I have some data sitting uh, on a website, some data sitting in a SQL database, some data sitting in my CRM system. How do I actually combine all of this data and uh, and turn this into you know just um, combine this and then get insights on all of that data. Um, then there is, uh, I, I can actually keep going, I mean, here, right? So um, uh, where do I actually deploy my apps, right? So um, there is uh, different options. I mean, where do I host the apps? These are not the only options. And by the way, this is by no means complete. This should give you an uh, understanding of the, the, uh, the bits and pieces and the components of a design pattern that involves um, LLM applications. Um, uh, I have seen apps that use maybe half of them, right? So a very basic app will definitely have, a very, very basic app will certainly have um, a foundation model, the main foundation model, whether you use it, uh, you deploy your own foundation, open source foundation model like Llama 2, you deploy it yourself uh, on premise, or you use uh, some of the, the APIs uh, and use them, send data and receive responses. It will definitely have a vector database, for sure, right? So if you're doing in-context learning, you uh, you have to have a vector database. You will need something for embeddings. And um, depending upon how you want to do it, uh, Langchain or uh, orchestration frameworks might be needed. And then uh, if you want to surface the data as a web app uh, or some kind of uh, application that others can use, some kind of UX, then you will actually be using uh, you know, some, some of the players here, right? And the other things are really, you know, they're optional. If I want to save cost, I want to um, you know, uh, architect the, my app better, I'm going to actually include you know, vector data, uh, rather uh, an LLM cache. Uh, if I want to uh, make sure that my output is, um, um, you know, does not have any systematic problems, I'm also going to include a validation framework as well. Okay, um, and uh, I am going to uh, take questions now, Nathan. So. So uh, Bernard's question is, uh, will this putting a lot together architecture be covered during the boot camp? Uh, yes, and more than that. Right? So basically, uh, for those of you who do not know, we are actually we have announced uh, an in-person boot camp. We are partnering with uh, some big names. I cannot, since the partnerships are not finalized, some of the big players in vector databases, foundation models, uh, orchestration frameworks, some of the logos that you saw there, they are actually jointly, uh, they are going to be involved in delivering that bootcamp with us. So they are our partners. Uh, so we will be delivering this, um, uh, this bootcamp that we will, um, uh, even if, so even if you come in without any background uh, in uh, building uh, LLM applications by uh, the last day, four days we learn different components and on day five, you're going to actually build a working uh, live language model app on your own data um, or your own enterprise data. So I think, uh, Bernard, uh, great to see you and looking forward to seeing you at the bootcamp. I know you're planning to attend. Okay, uh, so let me start from the top. Okay, uh, how can... Uh, um, okay, so Chimuel, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, I apologize. So let me see. 
um, how can you we support uh, uh, social problems, social inequality, poverty, and food insecurity? Right. So I think uh, um, it's a hard question, right? So it's 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 a technology, right? So how can internet be used for this? Maybe how can um, uh, self-driving cars be be used for it? Right. I think uh, the tools are there. Uh, we know that uh, uh, we know that. Uh, uh, we can pretty much do any uh, any kind of language generation. Think of this as uh, you know the eloquence or the the the, uh, the language capabilities that uh, only you know I don't know demagogues and political leaders or maybe you know um, prophets had it in the past, right? So now you can actually generate this using uh, all that language uh, or all that understanding or you know coming up with. So there is a language side of it and also being able to read a lot of document, being able to process all of the documents, um, you can do that uh, uh, in a very short amount of time. So I think it depends upon the ideas, right? So um, maybe let's, let's uh, for argument's sake, I mean, th that's a long discussion, but food insecurity. Uh, if I have to do it, um, maybe I will uh, take 100 papers uh, plus books on food insecurity, and uh, maybe feed them to chat GPT. And of course, it's not as easy as that. I mean, go, do some good prompt engineering. And I will say, make some recommendations uh, th uh, that will work uh, for handling the food insecurity problem, right? So I think it's uh, a lot can be done. Uh, what a human would do otherwise, uh, they will read the papers, they will think uh, and you know go through all of the documents and come up with recommendations. I think large language models can. Um, uh, uh, they can do it. Okay, I hope this is because there's a long list of questions. So I am going to actually move to the next question. Is vectorization the process of getting an embedding? Yes, uh, when you're getting, um, you're converting the embeddings, but there is actually uh, converting your uh, object where the audio video image into, uh, into a vector, that's basically getting an embedding. Embedding also has, I mean, call them, uh, you know, technically it could be any vector, but I think uh, in literature, often embedding refers to when there is a semantic component to it. I mean, that's uh, how I look at it, but yes, I mean, you are right, Edward, that is the case. James, um, does audio and ve vector embedding need to be in a different space table from video embedding? That's a very interesting question, James, right? So I did not think about this. I do not think so. I mean, so it depends upon your application, right? So if you have, uh, if you are working on, well, uh, you know, uh, if you're searching um, for things based on both uh, how they uh, visually plus uh, audio, uh, the, so video has an audio component, but audio does not have that, you know, picture component. I think it purely depends upon uh, your applications. Uh, you can actually map both of them into the same vector space. There is nothing that will stop you from uh, doing that technically, but um, beyond that, I think it's uh, uh, it is uh, I think it is your choice. Uh, depends upon you know how you're uh, structuring your application. The next question is: What are some commonly used vector database solutions? There are a lot of them. Uh, Redis is there. Redis is actually I think I should disclose. Uh, Redis is our partner in uh, doing the bootcamp as well. Uh, and then uh, there are there's uh, there's Pinecone, there is uh, VV8 is there. Uh, why am I blanking out? There is Zillis, uh, Milvus, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of them. There is a lot of uh, other. Um, there, there's a lot of other uh, players in the space. Uh, if you search for available vector databases, uh, it should you should get a list. Okay, then. Um, Sashmal, I will answer your question. You have another question. Let me just come back uh, to it. I will answer. Uh, I will take at least one question from um, all of you. So there is statistics as uh, many tools, but LLM only use the, I don't know what that means. And then there is Fox, your question is, Yes, uh, there's a question. Cosine similarity does not account the, uh, for vector length. Yes, it does not take into account the vector length. It only sees whether the two vectors are aligned or not. Uh, then we have... Uh, 
Can you explain how you go from storing the concept Apple as a vector to storing an entire document as a vector? I wish there was a possibility, maybe, maybe some other webinar. Uh, if you are interested, uh, take a look at uh, the paper. Uh, someone from the team, if you can find uh, very quickly the paper, attention is all you need. Uh, I think that would be, or maybe process of creating. It. So if you look it up, it basically, um, um, there are models that have some weights assigned for each of the words in a sentence. Uh, so, uh, but I mean, explaining that in such a short amount of time, I do not think that would be possible. So I apologize for that. Uh, how would one go about using transfer learning to build an LLM to a, a training a domain specific search QA service, right? So uh, in context learning that I talked about um, is the answer. Um, okay. Uh, okay, Andrew, yes, I did already answer in the talk. Then uh, if I can, uh, if I could explain the challenges of multilingual and cross-lingual capabilities in large language models. Additionally, how do you these models handle languages uh, with different linguistic structures, right? Your model is uh, going to do only what it is trained to do, right? So, um, so, uh, the, so you know, uh, I, I don't know what how exactly to explain like a uh, like a linguist here, right? So different la languages they have different, uh, you know. Maybe uh, if I talk about a black cat in in some languages, uh, it would be black cat, and other languages might be, uh, maybe cat black, right? So you know, uh, they can be different sequences. So I mean, th definitely there are some challenges there. Um, and then you have to, uh, you know, consider that uh, a model may work or may not work uh, if it is not trained on the language it was trained on. Then uh, let me see, how does a pre-trained model is still ingest and process new content? Uh, as I mentioned, if you go back, uh, Zed, this is your question, Zed S. Uh, so how does a pre-trained model is still ingest and process new content? summarizing a new document, right? So if you look at it, uh, I think I, I answered that. Uh, maybe this was question was asked at 1033. So I already answered that question in the talk. Please go back and refer to the slides around uh, context in context learning. Okay, uh, what is the reason the context window is smaller? Does making context window larger cost more? Absolutely, it is all about money at the end of the day, right? So, uh, so when you take a bigger context window, uh, you're basically there is a quadratic increase in um, in uh, in the cost of training because so let's say I was taking a window of ten words, think of this as I'm I'm considering all words against all words how likely they are to co-occur right so the bigger the window more permutations more combinations, and uh, uh, and and that results in actually uh, some kind of uh, you know challenges right so um, uh, most notably you know that um, compute. Um, that uh, I, I looked at this research paper recently, uh, and if you and they were talking about a, I think a, a context window of I don't know a billion uh, a billion tokens, right? So it's all uh, theoretical, of course, right? But once you get there, you're basic basically talking about uh, potentially a model that knows everything, right? So literally every single thing. Uh, you know, just dump it in there and then you it knows everything. Then Akshata, what is the language generation versus language uh, uh, versus knowledge representation in layman terms? Um, language generation is the semantic capabilities. Uh, so um, uh, so when I speak, I start saying something, right? So you know, you you expect what might be the next word, right? So that is based on your understanding of the language. Um, uh, that's language generation, right? So um, the semantic capability, the English language capability. But however, the knowledge generation uh, or knowledge representation is the domain specific, uh, uh, domain specific things. Um, foundation models like ChatGPT, they do have some knowledge representation that is available in public domain, but my tickets and my, my customer emails or my, my sales proposal, my insurance documents, insurance proposal that I sent out, all of them are knowledge representation because they are not quite in, uh, in the foundation model. Okay, the next thing, if we use a vector DB to supplement a foundational model, 
how can I be sure that my prompts and my proprietary data doesn't become part of OpenAI's training data? Yes, of, of course, that uh, Phil, you should absolutely be concerned. Uh, and if, for those of you who do not know, and we are on Zoom right now, as I speak, Zoom is uh, listening to us. I mean, our Brick Brother Zoom is listening to us. They're recording and possibly, you know, they have everything, right? So uh, if you do not want, I do not know what the terms of service are, but some, um, some companies, they decide to actually deploy. If this is a concern, if this is your concern at enterprise level, um, and which some of our clients do have, actually. So you will deploy an on-premise uh, solution, or rather, and, and I should not say on-premise, but you will take an open source model and deploy it on your own, uh, within your own cloud subscription, so you don't go and call OpenAI. And there are some options, Anthropic and, Lam, uh, and Lama2, being the most notable ones. Okay, my question is about Mona Lisa. Your question is, my question is about learning the limits and capabilities of enterprise LLMs. I'm currently building a stable workflow for enterprise and I would like to understand the capacities and challenges what I'm working with. Mona Lisa, you are, uh, I will sign you up for the next, uh, next webinar and next live event uh, two weeks from now that is exactly going to talk about this. What are the limitations and challenges? Uh, you know, cost is a concern. Repeatability is a concern. You know, hallucination is of course a concern. Uh, you know, latency is a concern. So I will go into all of them and potentially some of the mitigation that we can have um, um, uh, for uh, some of the problems. Okay, uh, the questions are actually, we still have a lot of questions. Uh, from where I need to start in vector database, right? So look it up, right? So um, uh, our partner Redis, they have a lot of uh, documentation around that. Uh, Pinecone has good documentation uh, and others uh, do as well, right? So go and look it up um, and that should do. Um, but if you search for uh, getting started vector databases, I think that would be. And if someone, Ramin and Nathan and Dua, if you uh, ask someone, I think we can share, I think um, uh, some, if one of the data scientists can actually recommend a few, uh, because we we have people who understand these things inside out. Um, if I ingest a doc to a vector DB and do a similarity search, can I refer back to the original document? For a query, of course. I mean, it depends upon how you structure it, right? So if you, because mm, the vector database only keeps the, the a representation of that document, so you can pull it up and maybe there is some reference back somewhere that you can always refer back to. Okay, um, how do you, ma how, how to manage multi-cloud setup where we are using Azure OpenAI and Bedrock both? I will have to pass this. And uh, I think Ramin, you were planning to share a uh, uh, share of uh, a, a form. I mean, if so, because I, I cannot answer this question because this is specific to a specific uh, technology, a specific setup. So, Manisha, uh, if you can ask your question on that form, that would be incredibly helpful. Can you explain more about validation frameworks? Yes. Um, you can, uh, validation frameworks actually help you make sure that your responses are repeatable, consistent, uh, nothing offensive in them, uh, nothing wrong, factually, politically incorrect. And so there are uh, many things that, uh, you know, uh, that might be needed. So I, I believe guardrails is the uh, most popular one. There's one by Microsoft as well. I'm forgetting the name. So please go and take a look. What does, a, what does a dream team look like to develop a production grade, scalable LLM based generative AI, uh, app? Data Science Dojo is the dream team, right? So, okay. So on a, on a, on a serious note, uh, we actually have a, 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 what I would call a dream team, exceptional, uh, you know, exceptionally talented uh, uh, developers and data scientists. So we have been working on these things. Uh, the dream team, definitely uh, LLM fundamentals. Um, they should uh, know the generative AI fundamentals, um, some basic data understanding. Uh, they should know what, uh, how to work with data. Um, and I think problem solving skills. I mean, you know, most of these things are very accessible. My, um, um, my pain point actually is usually not with whether someone is talented or not. It is just that they fail to see the, the business angle of it. Sometimes you're building a rocket ship where a simple, you know, uh, a, a moped would work, right? So I think it's uh, 
it's more about a good mix of technical and uh, and uh, problem solving skills and uh, and of course some some data fundamentals but it's a, it's a tough question to ans uh, answer uh, but at a very high level i can tell you as a as a manager this is what i think uh, can you explain more challenges and text summarize in uh, summarization? Uh, Laja and Laja, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, so um, uh, that would be the topic of our next uh, um, talk. Okay. Mm, how do you deal with the issues of model valuations in terms of model benchmarks, criteria, benchmark criteria, proprietary versus open source licenses, observability, and explainability for security, trust, and transparency? Uh, Bernard, since this is a question for, from you, uh, we will be covering this in our bootcamp, right? So we are going to actually, uh, we have, I believe, two more, or at least one module dedicated to just the QA and all of that, ML ops and bias fairness and uh, all observability and et cetera, right? So we'll do that. Um, but there are standard frameworks. You can put some test uh, or other uh, put some scripts and um, or there are some templates that you can use, and then you can actually um, uh, nicely embed them. All of these, uh, um, uh, all things that you, everything that you saw in the ecosystem, they work very nicely with each other. But I am going to, uh, I'm happy to set up a call uh, with you to uh, go through it if it is uh, something of urgent nature. Um, what is typical dimensionality of embedding vector spaces in LLMs? I believe 4096 is the number. That's a typical one that I've seen. Uh, okay, questions are still there. For enterprise data, how are you going to link your data to data operation database or Oracle or SQL, which are huge in uh, in a proper way to fine tuned LLM, right? That's a very good question, Omar. Uh, Omar, uh, it is. Uh, um, so orchestration frameworks like Langchain. Um, uh, I, I only know Langchain. I don't know. I mean, I know others. Uh, I've heard of them, but I've only looked at Langchain. Uh, they have actually connectors. So you can actually, if you need a Oracle connector, boom, you connect it, and then rest of the uh, system remains the same. If you need a CRM connector, go for it, right? So it, and these orchestration frameworks actually help you connect to your enterprise data without actually impacting the other flow of the application. How would your architect build an AI ML model to classify images? What foundation model could you use? You're talking about classification. So in classification, I think you do not need a foundation model. I'm, I'm if I understand your question correctly, right? So because uh, um, you will probably use a generative uh, model, right? So but not generative in the sense of you know large language model, right? So generative AI has been around for quite some time, right? So I mean now uh, sometimes people get confused, right? But this is more of a classic machine learning problem. It's not really an, uh, uh, but uh, I mean, you can probably use a foundation model, but using a foundation model for classifying images might be an overkill, right? But, uh, but if you really must, then there are actually models that can tell you, um, for instance, I mean, I've seen that at a, um, uh, can you describe this image? Hey, here's a child playing in a park here, and the child has a baseball bat in uh, her hand and, and so on, right? So you can do that, but this is more of a machine learning. Um, th this is more of a uh, machine learning, a classic machine learning problem, uh, if I understand this correctly. Um, yes, uh, Cynthia, your question is, can a knowledge graph be used? Uh, for retrieval augmented generation in addition to vector dbs absolutely and there is uh, i think there is uh, um uh, to handle hallucinations and all of that and you know uh, to uh, improve the quality of results knowledge graphs are being used in addition to your uh, you know um, foundation models okay uh, uh amir uh, i will i need help with building an application do you offer services to help yes we do we have a services side we are happy to help and uh, maybe nathan ramin Dua, if you can um you know if you can um just send them um uh, help at data science dojo or whatever email address will follow up uh what does similarity search solve uh similarity search actually well uh, solves the problem that exactly the, how, how it is described well um it finds all the similar vectors and now vectors could be um 
Uh, vectors could be images, vectors could be documents, vectors could be audios, vectors could be videos, vectors could be products, vectors could be movies, uh, Facebook posts, like really anything. To, uh, um, to a vector database, everything is, uh, is a vector. And similarity search is actually solving those, um, solving the problem of searching through hundreds of millions of vectors in the shortest, maybe sub millisecond latencies very quickly retrieving the most relevant uh, uh, vectors. Um, so you can actually uh, go and present it to your customers or maybe do, uh, you know, if uh, for uh, Amazon, it might be showing the recommendations. It uh, for, um, you know, for if you're building an in-context learning solution, then it might be that you have to give the documents to a foundation model so you can generate content. So different uses. Okay. Um, um, let me see, um, yeah, the, I mean, we are over time, right? So let me actually go take two more questions. I think the questions are never ending. So please submit questions. I did not expect the, uh, that many questions actually. So you mentioned that cost increases with context window. On the other hand, there is a benefit associated with the size of the context window, which is known uh, to start reducing. So uh, we need to get the sweet spot. Do LMs have a, uh, some way to build in to track this? Uh, I wish, I mean, so Amia, yeah, if you find a way, please let me know. Uh, I think this is where, you know, uh, I, I, I read this uh, something something uh, fun, uh, I know very true about it. So, um, Many of these curve jumping cutting edge technologies, when you are actually building a demo application, uh, life is good, it's amazing, right? So you build something. And as soon as you start actually building something that actually has a business impact and you have to make decisions based on that, it takes time. So that is actually, um, you know, practice, figure out, read, um, and uh, read a lot uh, and practice a lot, right? So. And I, the answer is, uh, to your question is, well, it depends, right? So yes, I mean, you um, you can overcome that context window limit uh, in different manners, uh, but if you can spend the money, go spend the money. If you cannot, then you really find the trade-off between, you know, how much you want to save and how much you will make uh, by, you know, taking different trade-offs. Take the last question. I really apologize everyone because we are way over time. How do we minimize hallucinations in contact learning, improving the situation? Are there other ways to reduce it, such as for law-specific use cases? This question is from Faisal Masood. Um, if you looked at, if you remember the example, Faisal, that I gave, the Harry Potter example, right? So I wanted to actually, maybe I wanted to add a slide I probably forgot, right? So that's actually, that is actually showing how to minimize hallucination. A tighter prompt engineering is the way to go. You know, uh, so sometimes you say, hey, prompt engineering, what's the big deal, right? So adding a few more things. No, I mean, I think prompt engineering is probably the most important aspect of building large language model application. Everything else is available. If you are the Faisal Masood that I already know, then, you know, you know how how incredibly, uh, you know, good to see you back, right? So uh, so if you, uh, if you look at this, it is, um, uh, technology is very accessible, right? It is that, it is that, uh, um, how you use it and how you actually how how determined how committed you are how much you how much effort you put uh, in fine tuning the systems so these systems actually require a, a great degree of fine tuning right so uh, and um, in the next talk uh, two weeks from now I'm going to talk about the fragility of these uh, you know prompts as well right so you can be so you have to be actually very tight around your prompts. Okay, my sincere apologies, everyone. I think Nathan is looking at me uh, and I will probably, uh, Nathan, I will stop here. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving you the, I have another call coming up, so we need okay. to stop. Um, but thank you so much, Raja, and thank you so much everyone for, for being here and, and asking these great questions. Um, we will have the key challenges in building enterprise LLM applications August 22nd at 11 a.m. Sounded like quite a few people were interested in that. So if you're on Zoom, maybe we'll just shoot you an email with that link to RSVP. Um, and uh, also, we did record this. We got a lot of questions about, is this recorded? Yes, we did record this. We'll have it up, I'm going to say, fairly quickly. Um, and it'll be available on our YouTube channel as well as at tutorials.datascienceDojo.com or datascienceDojo.com slash tutorials. Um, 
And then for the LLM boot camp, I know I think there was some interest in that as well. Um, uh, you can go to uh, our website, go to the menu, click uh, for individuals, and you'll find large language models boot camp in there. And I know the link's been posted as well. So um, feel free to connect with me if you're interested on the boot camp. I'm happy to talk about that with with anybody who's interested. So Raja, again, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much, everyone, for also spending an hour with us. Uh, we'll be in touch about the recording and about any upcoming webinars. Okay. Thanks, Nathan. And thank you, everyone.